So up to now, we've been talking about walls, and if we figured you'd probably be getting tired of walls, so we added a little section about roofs. Uh, roofs are a lot like walls, except that they are way out of plumb, and because they're so far out of plumb, they see a lot more water and UV light than walls do. So you need to detail them carefully not to leak, but you already knew that. So this isn't about what type of roofing to use, it's about avoiding trouble spots in the layers before the roof cladding even goes down. Uh, we're gonna look at roof flashing in general, the eaves, the rakes, step flashing, kick out flashing and valley flashing. Then we will go over some common trouble spots, the edges, um, the connections and transitions, because like walls, the places where things leak are where assemblies meet. The leaks not usually in the middle of the roof where there's nothing happening. It's usually where there are penetrations or transitions. So we'll look at the mechanisms. After that, we'll look at the mechanisms of ice dams and kind of go over vented and unvented roof strategies based on science. Um, so I've sat through a lot of uh, presentations where some socially challenged engineer runs through a bunch of bad photos of shoddy workmanship and basically makes fun of carpenters and roofers for not knowing that water flows downhill. Um, I mean, plumbers know it, right? But I mean, carpenters should know that waters flow downhill and I think that they all do and that's why roofs are pitched. Um, and the steeper the pitch, the faster the water flows. And, and we're not here to beat up on carpenters. We're here to talk about how to detail common trouble spots correctly. Um, roofs are the first line of defense against the bombardment of water and UV rays that come from the sky. And there is a lot of places where sweating the details can have a big improvement in the long-term durability of houses and the profitability and legitimacy of your business. Everyone knows there's two kinds of roof steep slope roof and shallow slope or flat roofs. Flat roofs are a different animal and we're not gonna cover them today. Instead, we're gonna focus on steep slope roofs, any roof with a pitch over 412. We'll do a quick overview of the flashing and taping sequence involved beginning at the roof deck where carpenters are still the main subcontractor. The roof um, that's in this video, it was I was shooting it in New Orleans. I was covering it for hurricane resistance, but there's also a New England roof in there as well. Uh, both of the roofs have zip system roof sheathing, but taping the seams of regular OSB sheathing is still a, a really great idea and has been found by the Insurance Institute lab to be extremely effective at lowering the risks from weather events like high winds and sneaky ice. In the first few parts of this series, we figured out where to snap that first line, how to work efficiently as a team, and how to measure and install the tricky hip pieces. Now that the roof is decked, we're going to seal it up against windblown rain and hurricane. We'll begin at the bottom with a 6 inch roll, folding the tape over the subfascia. Next, run tape up the rake and fold it over too. Valleys are taped with two overlapping pieces of 6 inch tape. Julio seals the bottom edge of the roof deck like in animation land. Because this shotgun style home in New Orleans has no overhangs, the roof tape is sealed to the weather barrier on the wall. In places prone to ice dams, the building code requires enough peel and stick membrane to reach two feet inside from the outside face of the wall. This usually means more than one strip of membrane. With his paper puller on the ground, Rick places membrane along the eave, working his way into the valley, being careful not to tear the paper or wrinkle the sheet. Oh, 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 oh. Now, he folds the edge over the fascia. Next, do the roof-to-wall joints. You can start at the bottom or the top, it doesn't matter. 
but make sure to use a 6 inch roll of tape. They fold the tape into the seam and then pull the folded paper back which neatly places the tape over the joint. The chimneys are flashed in the same order as always, bottom first, cut and folded around the corner, and then the sides are applied and folded around the upper and lower corners. The tape is rolled into place with a J-roll. Now they can tape the field with the 4 inch tape. First are the vertical seams between sheets in the first course of decking. Next is the lowest continuous seam running between the first and second row of decking. The second row of vertical seams is next, and so on. So the tape overlaps shingle style all the way up the roof. Finally, seal the hips and ridge with 6 inch tape. And make sure the tape is pressure applied with the J roll. We can dig a little bit deeper into some of those connections and transitions in the first video. Um, that showed basically the the, the bare minimum. So three main trouble spots in roofing is going to be the edge flashing, starter strip, um, dormers, and around and kickout flashing. So we'll look at edge flashing first. You probably noticed that the guys were folding the eaves membrane down over the top of the fascia. Uh, in New Orleans, they do this because they're always hung over and they can't remember which goes first. Um, that's not really true. They are always hung over, but they, they know how to battle sideways rain there because they happen to see a lot of hurricanes. The New England crew does the same thing to bend it over the, the fascia as ice dam protection, even though they don't think they're going to get ice dams because they're so good at their insulating details. Um, so here's an animation of how to storm proof the roof edges. Um, this is important anywhere where there's a tendency for high winds sideways rain or severe winter weather and the detail is based on fortified home standard guidelines of the insurance institute for business and home safety iibhs which is a terrible acronym and also uh, it was technical checked by mike gurton who you may have seen in fine home building and jlc live and jlc magazine too <laughs> With the roof deck sealed on the outside, we turn to flashing the edges. Metal drip edge flashing should go over the taped eave. The uphill leg should extend at least two inches up the roof, but more is better. For long runs that require multiple pieces of drip edge, overlap the seams the opposite direction of the prevailing winds, at least two inches. Install rake pieces to overlap the eaves, nailing every four inches staggered up and down. Valley metal goes over the sealed valley. Only the top is nailed into the roof deck. Other nails trap the edge of the metal, allowing it to expand and contract without buckling. Tape the edges of the valley metal. You can also seal the rake edge metal and the eave edge the eave needs extra protection from water and ice for two feet inside the outside of the wall. That usually means more than one strip of peel and stick membrane. Some people cut rolls in half to save materials. Scuff the surface of the flashing tape or clean it with acetone before applying an eight inch band of roofing cement along the bottom edge and up the rake. This ensures the two materials will make a solid bed for starter strip shingles storm nailed within two inches of the bottom of the shingle. The first course of shingles follows, storm nailed according to the manufacturer, and then you can work your way up the rake working into the valley. A belt and suspenders at eaves and edges will keep sideways water out of your roof.
again, so the gaps formed by two materials attached to each other, unless you seal it, it's a leak. So the eave detail is a durable one and it may seem a little extreme, um, but it's based on testing in a hurricane lab and Mike Curtin working through the method and, and order of operations. So it's, it's extreme, but it's at least uh, easier to install than if just an engineer designed it. Um, so that's roof edges. Another, another roof edge is the edge of the roof that butts into a wall, like, which is a typical trouble spot. Um, one of those situations is a dormer. Roof to wall connections um, are especially persnickety connections because the two assemblies are oriented in different directions, right? So when they shrink and swell, they don't shrink and swell in the same directions. They shrink and swell in different directions. And the shrinking is probably more of, the, more of a problem than the swelling. Um, and that means that the cracks and the gaps get even bigger. Um, one way to detail uh, the layers, one detail about the way the layers are completed in this, um, and you can see in this, in this drawing, is that you can see that the the edge of the step flashing and peel and the peel and stick membrane and the roofing underlayment go above the edge of the step flashing. Um, there's no reason, according to physics, that you have to do this. The only reason is that so that superintendents can verify that it was done correctly from the ground. They don't have to climb up on the roof. Um, that advice comes from Doug Horgan of BOA. Um, and he had a couple of other things, you know, he said to make sure to wrap that up, wrap that, wrap the, the, the roof underlayment up five inches and use four inch step flashing. Um, you wrap it up five inches so that you can see it above the four inch step flashing. He says also to make sure that the house wrap is cut in such a way that the roof paper can be tucked underneath because the house wrap will have to go over that step flashing. Um, so this this detail and animation is based on the technical advice again from from Boa from Doug uh, Horgan in DC, um, and also from Hammer in Hand, who is a high super high performance builder remodeler in the Pacific Northwest, where they see a lot of rain, and also my friend uh, Matt Jackson, a remodeler from South Dakota gave some two cents here at about the step flashing and about the, the caulking parts in this. So let's have a peek at that. Last time we were on the roof, it was to install some valley flashing. This time, we're going to hop over to the other side and tackle a dormer. First, we'll strip away the layers and begin at the beginning with a couple courses of roofing membrane and drip edge flashing. Roofing underlayment can be installed on the roof, but hold it back from the roof wall joint. Cover the connections with peel and stick membrane, and then fold the underlayment up the wall higher than the step flashing for easier verification. Install shingles to the base of the dormer, notching the end piece appropriately. Lay a bed of roofing cement along the top course just below the dormer and bed the base flashing into it. The first piece of step flashing should turn the corner and extend over the base flashing. Nail through the shingle and into the roof to avoid movement problems between the roof and wall. The next shingle extends below the previous step flashing, and the next step flashing goes on top, aligned above the next shingle. and so on, continuing up the side of the dormer. At the top, fold a closure flashing with a piece of sheet metal that can tuck into the crotch where roof meets soffit. The next row of shingles can slip under the closure flashing. Finally, you can install the house wrap over the top of the step flashing and base flashing. Now, you've got a roof wall joint that won't leak into your good night's sleep. Okay, so dormers are an example of another roof wall interface where the roof is longer than the wall, right? The roof extends above and below the wall section, um, but a different roof wall interface 
is uh, where the the wall is longer than the roof. So the water from the roof dumps water against the wall below it. And there are frequently windows in walls. So the roof is dumping water onto the tops of windows. Uh, it's, it's shockingly common to see in older houses or even in newer houses. Um, so Doug says to always use a kickout flashing. BOA has required them for 10 years. Kickout flashings are in the code now, but many people don't even know what they are. And he also says to use four inch step flashings. Many siding manufacturers, the reason is because many siding manufacturers require a two inch space between the siding and the roof. So he feels like four inch flashings are a minimum. And there's his rationalization. So let's look at the kick out flashing. This detail is another sort of Uber detail by Hammer and Hand from Portland and Seattle. Uh, maybe more trouble than many want to go through, but including a kick out flashing and overlapping the layers properly is going to drastically improve the durability of your houses. <laughs> Ground zero for roof rot is often where roofs meet walls. If you don't direct water from the roof into a gutter, it can pour into the wall. Avoiding problems begins at the beginning with a gap between the subfascia and the wall sheathing. Apply a waterproofing membrane where the bottom of the roof meets the wall. The membrane should be about eight inches wide and extend below the fascia about four inches. As you apply this paint on membrane, seal it into a strip of flashing tape to integrate with house wrap later. The tape should extend at least 10 inches past the fascia. On the roof, install a row of roofing membrane along the eave, folding over the bottom two inches onto the fascia. Install drip edge metal along the eave and then run a strip of peel and stick membrane up the roof wall corner. Fold the membrane up the wall about eight inches. Install roofing felt or synthetic roofing underlayment running it up the wall at least as high as the step flashing will be. A starter strip of roofing is installed along the bottom edge of the roof and kickout flashing is installed in place of the bottom piece of step flashing. The first course of shingles is installed. Next comes step flashing, which should overlap the previous piece by about two inches. Install another strip of peel and stick membrane over the top of the step flashing, cutting a slit for the kickout flashing. Below the roof, install house wrap, integrating the top with the strip of peel and stick tape already in place. Add another course of house wrap, overlapping the lower course, tucking it behind that subfascia. And making a slit for the kickout flashing. Install siding as normal and keep the bottom couple of inches above the roofing, regardless of siding type. Install a gutter behind the drip edge to collect the water and you can channel all of that water off the roof and into the downspout. Okay, so, you know, when big remodeling companies like BOA and Hammer in Hand invest a bunch of time in figuring out best practice details to eliminate the worst callbacks from their subs and crews, I feel like it's a really good idea to pay attention. So these details are really extreme, but they didn't make these details to put it, you know, for some magazine article to, you know, wow their friends. They made them for job site superintendents to execute efficiently. So it's not, I mean, it's, it's based on experience from um, finding mistakes. So what? So good judgment comes from experience and experience comes from bad judgment. So it it's, it's good judgment based on experience. Um, so now we can hit a topic that editors love because it happens every year, always, 
we can always publish articles and videos about it every year because everyone will always click it every time, literally. It's like the crown molding of roof problems, uh, ice dams. One thing that makes it mysterious is that none of the subs really have to take responsibility, right? It's not the roofer's fault if there's an ice dam. Um, roofers add layers to protect against inevitable ice dams, but roofers can't prevent ice dams. Um, drywall contractors have to come in and fix the damage, but they can't prevent it that they know of. Um, in general, you know, an ice, uh, snow melts on the warm part of a roof and dribbles downhill until it gets to a cold part of a roof and then it freezes. Uh, the next bit of water that's going to melt, or I guess the water can't melt because it's water, the next bit of snow that melts and dribbles as water downhill freezes when it gets to the frozen previous dribble, and then the ice builds taller. And as the ice continues to build up, water can pool behind it on the warm part of the roof. And, you know, water is no pool. It knows that it's warm inside, so that's where it goes, inside the house, any way it can usually by gaps and cracks where two pieces of lumber or sheathing meet. And that illustrates the concept that if you don't seal it, it is a leak. Not it could be leak, it is a leak. Homes in cold and snowy climates can sustain moisture damage from ice dams in the winter. An ice dam is a ridge of ice that forms at the edge of a roof and prevents melting snow from draining off the roof. Icicles are an indication that ice dams are forming. Ice dams are caused by non-uniform temperatures on the surface of the roof. Snow melts over the warmer areas, perhaps where the insulation is thin and heat is escaping from your home. The melted snow runs down to the cold edge of the roof and freezes, forming icicles and ice dams. The ice dam on the edge of the roof can cause water from snow melt to back up and form pools on your roof under the snow. Eventually, this water can seep through your roof and cause damage to your insulation, ceilings, and walls. Ice dams can be prevented. The best approach is to prevent heat from the interior of your home from escaping into the attic and warming areas of the roof deck. To accomplish this, the first thing you need to do is to make sure the ceiling beneath the attic is airtight. Air seal every seam and hole in the ceiling from either the interior or the attic side. Try to limit the number of holes you make in your ceiling. For example, you can install track lighting or ceiling mounted fixtures instead of recessed can lighting to avoid cutting larger holes in your ceiling. Another reason to avoid using recessed canned lighting fixtures is that they can introduce heat directly into the attic, especially if they are not airtight, insulation contact rated, and covered with insulation. If possible, do not install heat ducts and furnaces in the attic, particularly if you live in a location with significant snow accumulation. It is nearly impossible to air seal and insulate these systems well enough to prevent heat loss from warming the roof deck and causing snow melt and ice dam formation. A well-sealed and properly insulated attic is essential to preventing ice dam formation. However, the type and level of insulation you use depends on whether your attic is vented or unvented. If your attic is vented, make sure the attic floor is well insulated, especially over the top plates. If your home was not designed with raised heel trusses, as shown here, you can spray foam from under the baffle to the attic floor to get full insulation coverage. Leave a minimum of a 2-inch space between the roof deck and the wind baffle to vent the underside of the roof deck. Install vent screens at every rafter bay to provide exterior air to flush away any heat that gets to the roof deck. If your house has a compact roof assembly with an unvented attic, there are two options for insulating the attic to prevent the formation of ice dams. These options depend on the climate where you live and the weight of the typical snow load on your roof. If you live in a moderately snowy area with snow loads less than 50 pounds per square foot, you can choose to leave your attic unvented. However, it will be necessary for you to add a fully adhered air barrier membrane to the top of the roof sheathing that covers your fully insulated attic. Apply rigid foam insulation equivalent to R50 on top of the air barrier membrane in two or more layers with horizontal and vertical joints staggered. 
Install plywood or OSB sheathing over the rigid foam insulation as a nail base for finishing the roof and screw down through the rigid insulation to the roof decking or timber rafters. If you live in a region with snow loads greater than 50 pounds per square foot, the snow itself creates an insulating blanket that can elevate the temperature of the roof deck above freezing that can cause snow melt and ice dams. To counteract the thermal effect of the heavier snow load, you will need to add ventilation by constructing a vent over roof on top of your unvented compact roof. As with the unvented roof procedure, you begin by applying an air barrier membrane to the top of the roof sheathing. Cover the membrane with the rigid foam insulation, but increase the number of layers to a minimum of R60, staggering the horizontal and vertical joints as before. Apply roof sheathing and roof membrane over the rigid foam insulation. Leave an inch or so of space for venting between the roofing membrane and the installation of the last layer of roof sheathing before finishing the roof. Be sure to vent the fascia to allow exterior air to flow under the over roof to keep it cool. Upgrading your ceilings, attic, and roof to prevent ice dams will make your home safer and more durable. It also may pay for itself in avoided repair costs for water, mold, and structural damage. So, yeah, so, I mean, a lot of the what we covered in the early part when we're talking about, you know, how air moves through a house and how heat moves through a house is illustrated right there, um, in a, especially with a can light. You know, it's a hole in the ceiling that basically heats air up and pushes it up into the into the attic and pulls it's going to by definition pull cold air in so not only is it going to heat the attic and potentially cause an ice dam but it's also going to pull a lot of cold air in at the floor and make people uncomfortable and waste a bunch of energy possibly dumping moisture into the into the attic area as well so it can rot your roof and create an ice dam it's just there's a whole bunch of things that can snowball on you so to speak so ice dams are preventable. They're not inevitable. Ice dams are not the roofer's fault. More important, the roofer doesn't know how to fix them aside from adding ventilation, um, which maybe they're not the best person to figure out. Ice dams are really not your insulator's fault either, though by now insulation contractors should be air sealing experts and they should be able to help figure this out at the get-go, but many are still not. Um, ice dams basically are the general contractor's responsibility because they're a problem caused by gaps and cracks between all of the trades. And if you don't seal those gaps and cracks, they're a leak. And it's gonna be a leak to your wallet if, you know, if you're not careful. So let's look at some solutions. I, I did wanna note uh, to John, I, we're I think a, a little ahead of time so it might be a good time to wake up Alden and let him know that he's going to be on deck pretty soon. Oh, I think so, Alden's ready. I, 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 uh, I got faith in him. <laughs> okay, oh, so wait. I'm going to take I'm, my... I, I've got my fourth cup of coffee here. Oh. I'm, I'm doing good. I might have to use the bathroom first, but I'm good. Yeah, you better do that, Alden. Go, yeah. go dang it. <laughs> All right, so we'll look at some unvented and vented roof um, retrofits and talk about when and how to use them. So... Another thing that construction editors like me like is the big vented versus unvented roof debate. It's like the sidewinders versus worm drive debate. Uh, really, it's not, there's not a debate. It's just often a bunch of people who are talking past each other and not listening. Vented roofs are an excellent idea and you should absolutely vent your roof if at all possible. Sometimes it's not possible, like with a hip roof, or with roofs with a lot of dormers or other geometric configurations that can interrupt a direct path from the eave to the ridge. If a roof has a difficult configuration, sometimes the best ventilation strategy is to not vent it at all. So I think it's worth pointing out also that attics are different than roofs, which seems pretty obvious, but um, it's worth saying out loud because it matters because gable vents vent an attic which sits under a roof and technically vents the roof keeping the roof cool but if you choose to convert that attic into living space like 
everybody does in New England, and I'm sure they do it where you live, the vented roof suddenly goes away. And now you have to figure out how to either construct a vented or unvented roof assembly over that live, that attic living space that you're going to make. Um, and chances are you're going to have to meet some new energy code um, R values in that. So there's going to be a lot more to it than just, you know, putting down subflooring and, and putting up drywall and calling it a day. Um, so here's, so we'll start with a couple of animations about retrofits for vented and unvented roofs. I'll start with the unvented roof first, not because I think it's better, but because the vented roof assembly adds from the detail covered here. So this is sort of step one. Um, I think all of these, in these videos, the layers of foam are two inches. If you live, you know, in Northern Minnesota, you might want to add another layer or use thicker foam or both. Generally two layers of foam is better than one layer of foam because you can offset the joints and you won't, you know, you won't have, you know, railroaded joints that'll be actually thermal breaks or thermal um, nosebleeds. Um, there's tables and charts again for figuring out the right depth and thickness. You can find the, you know, the bare minimum is in the code and then you can talk to local building science experts like Pat Hulman and the University of Minnesota about what the best approach to be would be. Adding exterior foam to an old roof is a good idea whenever a re-roof is planned. Because old roofs were often framed with 2x6s, there isn't much room for insulation. Nowadays, energy codes require a lot more. First, strip the old roof and cover it with a peel and stick roofing membrane. Next, cut off the rafter tails. This will make a simpler shape for the air barrier. Close off the rafter bays with rigid foam or plywood. Remove enough siding so that you can get to the house wrap and then seal it to the roofing membrane with flashing tape. Install two layers of rigid foam with the seams offset tape the seams on the second layer. Extend the foam beyond the wall about four or five inches to make it easier to weave into exterior wall foam later. Apply two by fours on the flat over each rafter and fasten with long screws. The two by fours can extend past the foam to create a new roof overhang. Add blocks of mortar mesh and insect screen between the two by fours to keep bugs out. Apply a new roof deck over the 2x4s and dry it in with roofing felt or an impermeable synthetic roofing underlayment. Ladder style blocking provides the structure of a torsion box which ties the fascia, soffit, and roof overhang together into a built up beam. And don't forget to do the math on your soffit venting. On top of it all, Apply whatever kind of roofing you want. Adding insulation to the outside of a roof is a once in a lifetime opportunity to bring an old house into the 21st century. Yeah, similar to the one that we looked at earlier on the, on the wall section where they did the walls as well. Um, that detail should work in most places. Again, uh, foam thickness will depend depending on where the climate zone is that you're in. Uh, and for deep snowy areas, um, you might want to add more insulation or step up to this sort of bomb proof roof style with that includes ventilation above the foam. Adding exterior insulation to the roof of an old house is a great way to improve comfort and energy efficiency. It especially makes sense if the rafter cavities are already insulated. It's most affordable when the roof needs replacement. The first order of business is to strip the roof. Cut the rafter tails so that the connection between the roof and walls can be sealed with peel and stick membrane. Dry in the roof. Install two layers of insulation to the roof, staggering the seams, offsetting the joints, and taping the outer layer. New roof sheathing on top can extend out to create a roof overhang. It is held in place with screws that reach one and a half inches into the framing. 
On top of the sheathing, install a waterproof but vapor open roofing paper to avoid trapping moisture between it and the peel and stick. Box out a soffit and tie it all together with a fascia. Out of a roof is a once in a lifetime opportunity to bring an old house. Continuous insulation and multiple layers of air sealing can turn a leaky old house into a 21st century home. So I didn't include a ridge vent in that um, illustration because I thought it was pretty obvious. I just showed the soffit vents, but in case it wasn't obvious, um, the soffit vents should vent up to a ridge vent. And there's actually calculations on that. Um, and there's numbers in the code that tell you how much venting you need. Uh, it's worth doing that and not leaving it up to your roofer. So we've come to my favorite slide in the entire day. It's the last one for me. Um, not that I don't enjoy this, but my back is getting sore from sitting in the same chair all day. Um, roof problems, solutions, details, and dilemmas are a pretty big topic. And we covered some important trouble spots and some common questions, but there's still you know, a lot more to explore. Um, I would say go to the, the Fortified Home Standards Guidelines from the Insurance Institute of Business and Home Safety. It's based on ginormous wind tunnels blowing water and sparks and everything against houses and see, looking for leaks. Um, again, you know, buildingscience.com is another great resource. If you go there and search for a crash course in roof venting, you'll find a really killer article. I think it was like the last article I did with Fine Home Building with uh, Dr. Stebrick. Um, there's also an article there, of Unvented Roof Assemblies for All Climates, which will just help you sort of work through uh, the details and the considerations. And once again, all of the coursework and links for all of this stuff will be in an email that'll be coming to you um, a little while after class. And so I suspect that it's now time for any questions that we have.